Have you ever felt that in your life there might have been so many things that you've achieved, so many things that you've done, and still something feels empty? There's a part of your life that you think, by now it should feel better. And in this series, I'm going to be looking at how do we resolve that? How do we come to a state in our life where life actually starts feeling better? How do we feel more joy, more bliss, more happiness? We're going to be taking a journey, a journey of soul searching, a journey of examining our lives by looking at the verses of a composition by the third Guru, Guru Amr Das Ji, called Anand Saib. And I want you to think about this as an opportunity to reflect on some of the bigger questions in life. Reflect on what is my life really about? So Anansai begins with the name and the title Rag Ramkali. Mahalatija, the third guru, or the guru in the third house, and the title Anand. And it begins with Ikonkar Satgur Prasad. Oneness vibrating infinitely, known by the true guru's grace. Bliss has emerged, O oh my mother. I have obtained the true guru. The true guru was obtained with tranquility and songs of celebrations resound within the mind. Melodies and harmonies have come to sing the Divine Word. Sing the words of Hari, those who have embedded this in their mind. Nanak says, bliss has occurred. I have found the true Guru. Now Anand Sahib is a verse I'm sure that you're all familiar with. Certainly within the Sikh tradition, it is sung on every single occasion, at the end of every single ceremony, whether it is a ceremony of joy or a cer ceremony of loss. The Anand Sahib, whether you're getting married, whether a baby has been born, or whether it's just your regular service that you go to, Anand Sahib is the one thing that is always being sung. So it's such an important composition that we need to understand. And the opening line is a line of celebration. It's a statement to mankind by the third Guru, Guru Amr Das Ji, who's written this. It's a statement to mankind that says, hey, listen up, I've found true bliss. So he starts by saying, bliss has emerged. And how has he found this true bliss? He says, I have found the bliss because I found the Guru, the true Guru. And it's a statement to mankind because we are always searching. No matter what, if you notice when you wake up in the morning, that search begins. We're always hunting for happiness. We're always on the lookout for the next thing that can give us this feeling of true bliss. And it's because somewhere deep-rooted within us, we know that true bliss is actually possible. There's a part of us that actually believes true bliss, the experience of it, is there. It's, it's, it's achievable. It's attainable. We should be able to find it. And we do so many things in our lives just to try and achieve that bliss. And Guru is saying that joy, excitement, pleasures that we experience in the world, these things are temporary. And he says, I found something else. I found bliss. He uses this word anand. And the word anand almost means euphoria. But not just because of something good that's happened in my life. He's talking about something from a far deeper place within him, almost at the core of his being. He's saying, I'm now euphoric, right at the deep of who I am. And it's not dependent on something external. It's not dependent on our senses. I'm not happy because I'm in a good mood today or I've got everything that I need or I've just listened to a great piece of music or read a great book. That's not the reason why I'm, I'm in this euphoria. There's another reason. Something else has given me this deep-rooted sense of bliss. What is the experience of that? He says, when I'm in this bliss, 
it feels like my mind is celebrating. There are songs and melodies. It feels like the whole world is now singing because I found something that gives me this experience. So what is it that he's found? What is the answer that gives you this true bliss that we all seem to be looking for? And the answer is something called the true guru. Well, what's the true guru? And we'll notice as we go throughout the Anand Sahib that the entire message is about how something called the true guru is giving us this really deep rooted sense of happiness and stillness and pleasure and peace that's unlike anything else that we've ever experienced. So how do we get this? What is this true guru that seems to be able to deliver something almost magical? When we talk about a guru, it's often something that puts people off. The idea of having a spiritual guide and straight away people feel concerned that we're being indoctrinated. There seems to be some religion that you have to join or a cult. And we worry when we hear some of this terminology because we haven't really understood what does it mean to have a guru in your life. Now, the most important thing to understand is the guru is not limited to a person. The guru isn't just one individual. When we look at the writings of Guru Nanak Dev Ji, even he says, I have a guru in my life. So really we need to unpack this understanding. The, the most important spiritual passage within the Sikh tradition is the Mool Mantar, written by Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And at the end of the Mool Mantar, Guru Nanak says, all of this wisdom and this oneness that I'm connected with is because of Gur Prasad. And same again, we see at the beginning of this Anand Sahib verse, Ikwankar Satgur Prasad. There is this one vibration all throughout the universe, but you only know it by the blessing of the true Guru. And throughout this Anand Sahib, we're going to be looking at how do we understand this Guru? How do we get this Guru in our life? What does it mean? So the first thing I want us to understand is Guru Nanak had a Guru. Guru Nanak has a Guru in his life. So Guru is not limited to a person. The Guru is an idea that predates Guru Nanak Dev Ji. It's an idea that's been around for tens of thousands of years. So it's really important that we understand the deeper meaning of what it is. The way I like to think about a Guru is the Guru is like the essence of enlightenment. It's like the spirit of enlightenment. The Guru is a catalyst to waken us up. And let's look at this word Guru itself. What does it actually mean? The word Guru can be split into two syllables, Gu and Ru. Gu being darkness, Ru being light. So the Guru is someone or something that can take us f away from our darkness into light. And very often when we try and translate the word Guru, we translate it to something like a teacher. But I like to think that a more accurate word for Guru is the enlightener, someone that transforms us, something that awakens us. So enlightener is a word that I think is the most closest thing that we can use to translate the word Guru. Now, what do we mean? What is this darkness? What is this light? A lot of the time in spiritual language, we use terminology like oneness, the universal force. And what that means is that the whole universe has an essence to it. It has a spirit to it. It has an aliveness to it. And that aliveness belongs to all of us. That aliveness is equally within you as it is within me. Whether you're religious or not, whether you're spiritual or not, it's equally inside a plant as it is inside a fish or a bird. It's, it's everywhere and it's everything. It's not limited to one thing. It's just the essence of the entire universe and that's been called a oneness. And so many times in various spiritual traditions, this oneness has been referred to as having the quality of light. It's light. 
it's bright, it's radiant. And the Guru is trying to get us to that light, get us to that experience where we're also connected with this spirit of the universe. And sometimes this has been used as the terminology God. Uh, and I think I, for me personally, I think the word God is a little bit limiting, which is why the word oneness seems to encapsulate what we're trying to talk about a little bit better. Now, Guru is trying to bring us out of darkness into this light. The Guru is the transformer from darkness to light. Now, if this oneness is the light, and this oneness is everywhere and is all around us, as an inside of us, and inside you and me and everything else, this oneness was there before time, before the universe was created, this oneness will always exist, then if that's the light, then what's the darkness? What's the darkness that the Guru is trying to get us out of? Well, the darkness is our mind. The darkness is not knowing, being in an unconscious state, unawakened state, unrealized mentality, where we are completely ignorant of the light of the oneness. So think about darkness to light being the difference between being asleep and being awake. Now they are very clearly two different states of being. But the Guru has constantly reminded us that we are asleep without even knowing that we're asleep. We are right now asleep because we are unaware of this oneness that we're connected with. We don't really know about it. We don't connect with it. We don't know how to in engage with it. So the Guru is trying to get us to change our experience of life itself. Our mind, on the other hand, is completely oblivious to it. So we are asleep and we are blind to what is really going on in the universe. The universe is essentially this living, breathing organism. And again, when I talk about the universe, I'm talking about something that's even beyond the physical universe itself. It doesn't matter that we are talking about, it doesn't mean that we're talking about just the physical stars and planets. Of course, that's a big part of the universe. But when I talk about universe, I talk about the wider sense of the word, almost as though we're talking about the spirit of the universe itself, the, the, the essence of life itself. Our minds are completely unaware of this. We don't spend any time engaging with it. And so we don't realize that we are also part of that essence of the universe. We are also part of that oneness. And when we don't realize this, we walk through life on our day-to-day -day basis always in our sense of me. We are completely only focused on our, our bodies, our families, our careers, our circumstances, our worries, all the things that are related to this individual body. This is the only thing that we think is the most important thing in life. And that's the ignorance that the Guru is trying to get us away from. That's the experience of life that the Guru is trying to say, hey, there's a better way of living life where you're not always just thinking about the me. Now, a really important question that you might ask yourself is, well, what's wrong with just thinking about the me all the time? This is where I live. I live in this body. When I wake up every day, this is what I have to deal with. My body, my family, my circumstances, my job, my career, my finances, my relationships. These are the things that I have to worry about. Why do I need to think about this oneness? Well, remember how we started this whole thing? We talked about how we spend most of our life trying to fill our life with happiness. We try to find happiness and the way we try and do it is we try and get lots of different things in our lives to work. We try and fix so many different things so our finances are all just right and we have a good job that means that we have enough income coming in and we're not spending too much and we have the right people around us and we look after our health and we look after our mental well-being. So we are constantly spending all of our energy trying to find bliss because we are locked in this body of me, this understanding of me, and we use this me to go out there and find bliss because the me is looking for bliss. 
the Guru is saying, well, if we address this understanding of the me itself, the myself, the me, the I, if we address this understanding so that you're spending less time worrying about the me and more time in awareness of the oneness that you're a part of, then you will naturally feel the bliss that you spend so much effort trying to get into. So with the Guru, the mind starts to realize that this me is not the ultimate reality. Now we're not saying it's not there, of course it's there, but it's not the ultimate reality. It's not, it's the perceived reality. It's the way, it's the thing that we use to try and look out with. It's that we look at the world through this lens of the me or the myself. And the Guru will point out throughout all the Guru's spiritual uh, teachings is what we use to find happiness is actually the thing that's suffering. The me itself is the cause of suffering, not the cause of happiness. The cause of happiness is to transcend the me, is to go beyond the sense of me itself. So the Guru is an essence, it's a quality, it's a principle that tries to bring us wisdom in our life, tries to get us to change the way that we think about our life and not think about the me, but think about this, our body and circumstances and relationships are all part of this game or this song of oneness. So that's what the Guru is trying to do in our life. Now, what is the Guru itself? Let's talk a little bit deeper about what is the Guru? Where is it? How do we find it? How do we engage with it? In the Sikh spiritual tradition, the Guru has been described as having three different shapes, three different forms. And I'll quickly go through what those three different forms are because it's important to understand how we engage with this Guru. The first one is described as being nirgun, formless. The Guru is not a physical being. It's not limited to just a particular person or a particular text or a particular wisdom. The Guru is not limited to that. The Guru is a nirgun being. It's a formless being with no physical essence to it. And what we mean by that is that begins to sound very much like the oneness that we talked about earlier. The oneness is there before time. It is in the world, it's in creation, but it's also outside of creation. If the universe was to di disappear tomorrow, the oneness would still be there. Now, when we talk about the Guru in the exact same way, we realize that the Guru and the oneness are actually the same thing. So the oneness is everywhere, but the oneness does many different things. And the way to think about the Guru is to think about the oneness as having many different jobs. Part of what the oneness does is that it creates. So it has a creator function. And part of what it does is that it sustains. It looks after things. It keeps things going just the way we're breathing right now. Have you ever thought about this? We're not actually breathing, but breathing just happens naturally. You never have to remind yourself to breathe. It's just there all the time. Even when you're asleep, you're breathing all throughout the day. It's happening. So that's what we mean by the oneness being a sustainer. It's constantly just keeping the systems going. It's keeping things flowing at all times. And the oneness is also the destroyer because you can't have life without life ending, without death. So it's constantly destroying things, putting things back into the universe, recycling things. And everything in reality is something that's been re recycled. Even our bodies are made up of, of cells and atoms that have, have been used for other things before. So the oneness is this creation force. It's this sustaining force. It's this destroying force. And one of the things that the, the oneness can do is that it also has the ability or the job or the role to awaken us. It has the ability to make us think differently. And that ability of oneness is called the Guru. The Guru has the ability to make us think differently. So the oneness is here. We are the oneness, the universe, and everything that you see all around you is really just another form of that oneness. And one of those forms, one of those functions is to help us change and guide us and this has been called, this, this ability of the oneness to delude us, 
and to awaken us has been called grace. And, and I use this word delude because I want to pique your interest here. The, you know, this everything that we're talking about, this oneness and the mind not being realized and not knowing it, how does all of this happen? The oneness has created all of us, you, me, and everything that you see around us. But it also created the illusion that we are not part of the oneness. It also created this idea within our minds that we are just me, myself. So it deluded us. It gave us, it gave itself a idea that you are an individual being. And then it also creates a guru, an enlightener, to awaken you away from that way of thinking. So it creates the problem, it creates the solution, and it is the solution itself. And when we start thinking like this, a lot of people might be thinking, well, that just sounds really strange. It sounds really weird. What's the point of it all? And this has been described by spiritual masters throughout so many different traditions as being almost the game of oneness, the game of God, the play, the music, the melody, the song. This is the oneness playing with itself. So as part of that process, it has the ability to change the way we think as well. And so what you need in order to understand, if you believe that you are this physical form, you need another physical form to awaken you. And so we now move to the second form or shape of the Guru. The first, remember, being the Nirgun shape, the formless shape. The second being a Guru that's called a sargun form, a formed guru, a guru which has a physical form. And this is typically what we, what we think about when we talk about a guru. You might think about um, a, 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 an old man with a white beard in spiritual robes, um, a sadhu of some sort that is a teacher, someone who you go to to learn your lessons. So the Guru can take many forms. It starts with this formless entity. It is the oneness itself. But in order for us to understand it, we need someone or something to actually engage with. And that's called the Sargun form. And that usually takes the form of an enlightened master. And what we mean by an enlightened master is someone who they themselves have awakened their minds. They themselves used to think one way, about themselves, the way you and me do, about I am the me and this is, this is me and my problems. And they themselves have been awakened. They themselves have transformed their thinking. So now they're connected with this oneness. So they are enlightened and have the ability to enlighten us. Remember, enlightenment means just to move from the ignorance that we are here, these limited individual beings, and it moves us into understanding and appreciating that we are part of something much bigger. So that's your nirgun form, your formless guru, your form guru, which is this enlightened master that can transform us. But how does the guru transform us? The sargun guru, the form, the physical guru, changes us through the third version of the guru, which is the wisdom of the guru. And this has been called shabad guru, the word or the message. And by Shabbat, what we mean is that the Guru has a message for you and for me to put into our mind, to understand that we need to think a little bit differently. The Guru comes with a message, comes with a wisdom, comes with a guidance. So we need to understand that the Guru has many different forms and all of these forms have a function in our life. And in the Gurmat spiritual tradition, more often than not, the word Guru has only ever been used to describe one of the three forms of the Guru, which is the Sargun Guru. Now, in the Sikh tradition, whenever somebody mentions the Guru, you pretty much always think that they're talking about Guru Nanak, or one of the Gurus, or you're talking about the scripture, Guru Granth Sahib Ji. And this is the Sargun form, this is the Sargun, the, 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 the form, the physical form, or the message form, which is the Shabbat Guru. But we need to understand that when we talk about Guru Nanak, what makes Nanak a Guru Nanak? What makes Nanak so special? Well, remember what we talked about, how the Guru has the ability to transform you, but first they need to transform themselves. Well, Nanak 
is somebody who has become enlightened to this new way of thinking, to this authentic, original way of thinking, where they understand who their authentic, true self is. They've understood that. But when Guru Nanak Dev Ji passed on to the second Guru, and we had Guru Angad Dev Ji and the third Guru, Guru Amar Das Ji, that Guru was essentially the same. We don't actually see the second, third, fourth, fifth Guru, all the way up to Guru Granth Sahib Ji in the form of the scripture. We don't see them as any different. Why not? Because it's not the person Nanak, it's not the body of Guru Nanak that we are interested in. It's the enlightenment of Guru Nanak. And that enlightenment moves from one to another. That ability to awaken a person and then awaken another and then awaken another, that awakenedness is what we're calling the Guru itself. And the way we demonstrate this, certainly within the Sikh spiritual tradition, if you notice at the beginning of Anand Sahib, it says, Mahalla Tija. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the word Mahal, Mahalla, is always used to say which Guru has written this Bani. But it never says, Guru Tija. It never says, written by the third Guru. It says, written in the third house. Now let's think about what that means. Now, imagine that you have moved house from your old apartment or your old home into your new home. Everything has changed, but you are essentially the same. You haven't changed. The things around you have changed, where you live might have changed, but you have just moved from one to another. When you buy a new house, you don't say, I'm a different person. You just live in a different place. And in the same way, Guru Nanak Dev Ji moving into Guru Angad Dev Ji is not a different person. It's the same message that has moved from Mehel. The word Mehel actually means house or mansion. So the Guru moved from one mansion to another mansion to another mansion. So when we say Mahal Atija, what we actually mean is that one enlightenment message that's always been there throughout time, from the beginning of time, the wisdom of oneness has always been there. That wisdom of oneness was in Nanak and now in Guru Angad and then in Guru Amar Das Ji. And now that wisdom within the Sikh spiritual tradition is in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. But that doesn't mean that the entire wisdom of that oneness of the Guru is only in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Now who knows how many other planets that are out there and where else the Guru has been and what other beings in, in multiple universes the Guru is also transforming. So we don't have this idea that the Guru Granth or the Shabbat is the only space where the Guru exists. The Guru doesn't exist anywhere else. Because if you think like that, then you've forgotten that the Guru has three different shapes. The Guru is formless, the Guru has form, and the Guru is in the shape of wisdom. So wisdom can be transferred even if you're not standing physically in front of a book or the Holy Scripture or the Word or the person or the man or the woman, whoever it is that you think is your Guru. You don't have to be standing there in front of them to say that I am in the presence of the Guru. You're always in the presence of the Guru itself. So when we're bowing to the Guru, you should always be very clear in your mind that you are bowing to this universal wisdom that is there to transform you. The Guru has one function, to transform the way you think. In the Japji Sahib, a verse that has an ending line that's repeated a few times is Gura ik dehe bujai, sabna jiya ka ik data, so me visar na jai. Guru, give me this one understanding, give me this wisdom that everything belongs to oneness, everything comes from oneness, sabna jiya ka ik data, and don't let me forget it. The Guru really has a one job and that's to make you realize that you are part of a oneness and to help you keep that realization. So it's very important that we understand what this Guru is. Now the other thing that's really important is to not externalize the Guru. And what I mean by that is let's not always think about the Guru as something different or outside of us. Now, think about these three different shapes of the Guru that I talked about. It's very easy to think that the Guru is something that's far away. The Guru is 
nothing to do with you. It's something bigger and greater than you. Remember what I said that Guru is the darkness to light transformation and that darkness is within your mind? When your mind transforms from your own ignorance to your own enlightenment, that is also called Guru. That means the Guru is not just a person who does that change. The Guru is the actual transformation that's happening inside you. And that's where the Guru starts to become something that is within you. And we hear in Gurbani as well, So Satgur Pyara Mere Naal Hai My true Guru is with me all the time. Jithe Kithe Menu Le Chadai Wherever I may be, it saves me, it rescues me, it, it frees me from the things that bind me down. So the Guru is always with you. Whether you've ever heard any spiritual wisdom in your, in your entire life, whether you, you've been brought up and you thought you were an atheist or whether you were religious or spiritual, whatever you think you are, remember the ability to change from darkness to light is already sitting there, dormant, resting within all of us. And so the Guru is something that is a process of transformation within us as well. So think about the external Guru as a catalyst to awaken the internal Guru, to, to have that internal transformation itself. We have to now understand that this whole verse of Anand Sahib is a transformation process that's going to be happening inside of us. So what is happening within, within us? We see in the next lines of Anand Sahib, Satgurta Paya Sej Seti Manvajiya Vadhaya The true Guru was obtained with tranquility and songs of celebration resound within the mind. So now we're starting to understand what is the Guru delivering? The Guru comes with stillness, with sahaj, with tranquility, with steadiness. I remember when I was a child and there was someone's house that I used to go to who had this huge grandfather clock. And I remember seeing the grandfather clock having this pendulum that would just swing from side to side. And as a child, I could look at it for such a long time and be completely hypnotized by this thing that was just moving from side to side. And I would only snap out of it when the clock would strike at a particular hour and then the, 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 the bells or the chimes would ring and that would make me kind of wake up and realize, oh, I've just been looking at this thing for far too long. And what that reminds me of is in life, we're kind of thinking like that in the same way. We're completely hypnotized by our emotions. We're hypnotized by all the circumstances and the, the changes that are happening in our life on a day-to-day -day basis. We are hypnotized by our thoughts that are always swinging from left to right, from making one decision or another, from happy to sad. And all this change that's happening in our life, we've become completely hypnotized by it. We don't know how to snap out of it. We think this is the ultimate reality. And the Guru is like the gong that once the Guru says something, it makes you step back, it makes you realize and breaks that trance that you're in. And you start to see things for what they really are. How does the Guru do that? We're told here that the Guru brings stillness, brings a tranquility to our life. And now we're not talking about some Zen-like silence experience. That's not what the Guru means by tranquility. It means that when your mind is swinging from left to right, moving this way and that way, when you're always waking up and worrying about the next thing that you have to do, the Guru gives you the ability to step back. And as soon as you step back, you're not swinging from left to right. You're not swinging from, from distress to pleasure. You are having a moment of peace and tranquility. And the more you're able to take on the wisdom of the Guru, the more of that steadiness and tranquility you can have within your life. And that steadiness takes on the qualities of having acceptance for the rat race of, of life. You're not being tied down by it. You're not, you, you're not letting it weigh you down. You know that it's there, but you're accepting of it. So you become an observer of, of life. You are less 
resistant. You're not constantly worried about the things that are happening. You are participating in life, but you're also taking a step back at the same time. So you're able to, with the Guru's wisdom, start to lead a life of no questioning and always worrying about, am I doing the right thing in life? Is this right? Is this wrong? You start to reduce your desires. You start to reduce the amount of complaining that you're doing. Things don't always have to be given a label of being good or bad, of should and shouldn't, should not have had and must not. These things don't necessarily have to be labels that you put on life. You're just participating in life, but you're taking a step back and you are observing life as something that is happening with lots of different changes, but you don't necessarily need to get trapped or hypnotized by those things that are going on in life. So this is the state of having this quality of tranquility in your life, having virtues, having compassion. It's from this stillness that all of these new good qualities come out. Compassion, peace, patience, humility, all of these good qualities start to emerge in your life when you use the wisdom of the Guru to step back. So when we start to look at Anand Sahib, we need to use this as an opportunity for us to also reflect on our life, for us to awaken from our old ways of thinking to new ways of thinking, for us to move from a state of being agitated all the time to being calmer, to being less resistant to the unpredictability of life and to be always in awareness that we have this Guru in our life. The very fact that you are right now present here listening to this message of the Guru, it means that you are so lucky to have the opportunity to step back. You've been given an opportunity to just take a moment to reflect on your life and that is a huge blessing in itself. Not everybody gets that. I always like to think that there are almost 8 billion people on the planet at any one time and out of those how many are completely hypnotized by their own lives and don't have the ability to just take a step back and think, what is my life about? Should I really be so lost in attachment to myself, my body, my life, my family, my job, my career, my finances? Do I need to be so stuck with all these things? Or is there a way to have all those things, to engage with all those things, but also take a step back? So this is what the Guru allows you to do. We're so lucky to have that in our life. Now, how do you find this Guru? How do you find this wisdom that does this for you? And as we go along the verses of the Anand Sahib, we're going to be seeing how the Guru enters our life. How do we actually make sure that we retain this relationship with this Guru as well? So we're going to be looking at very practical processes about how we can achieve not just the Guru, but the tranquility, the bliss, the euphoria that the Guru gives in our life. And in the upcoming verses, we're going to be hearing a lot about how this actually has very little to do with us. This actually is something called grace. So we're going to be hearing a lot about grace of the Guru and how Guru is a grace in our life. The very interesting thing that you'll notice in this, um, as we go through the verses of Anand Sahib, is that this composition actually has many audiences. It talks to many different people in many different perspectives. So this opening verse we can hear is talking to mankind saying, hey, I found the Guru in my life. And in other verses, it's talking to the mind. In other verses, it's talking to the body. In other verses, it's talking to meditators and spiritual seekers. So you'll see how this beautifully is able to talk to so many different audiences and almost different stages of our life. And so we'll be reflecting on this wisdom and we'll see how does this wisdom impact our life? How are we going to use this to reflect and make sure that the Guru is actually having this impact in our life itself. Think about this as almost the Guru not trying to sell you anything. And I know whenever, when it comes to spirituality, it's, it's very often um, the case that people think, this guy's trying to convince me of something. He's trying to sell me something. He's trying to 
make me do something that I don't want to do. And I don't want you to think about Anansaib in this way. I want you to think about it as almost a song of celebration that you happen to be listening to. There's this person called Guru Amr Dasji, and he's just singing with his real joy that look, look what my life is like. Look at what I've been able to achieve with this bliss. Look what my mind feels like. I wish you could also feel like this. And this Guru, Guru Amr Dasji is just singing. And look at the words that he's, he's, he's talking about. Look how much he talks about melody and music. He says, Manavajiya Vadhaya, songs of celebration are resounding within the mind. Melodies and harmonies have come to sing the divine word. And he says, sing the words of Hari. He tells us, everybody, if you want to feel like this, you need to sing like me. If you want to feel what I'm feeling, you need to be, do what I, you need to be doing what I'm doing. And what he says is you need to make your life into a song of bliss. He says that my life has completely changed. My mind is now constantly singing. It feels like the whole world is singing. And he's describing his euphoria. He's describing his state of bliss. And he says that the whole world is singing and my mind is singing. So now the, what the Guru is trying to do is trying to get you to understand the importance of another idea called Kirtan. And a lot of the times, again, in spiritual practices, we use this word prayer, that you, you wake up in the morning and you pray, or you wake up and throughout your day, your life is a prayer to God. And I think this word prayer really doesn't encapsulate what the Guru is trying to say here. I think what the Guru is trying to say is we need to stop praying and start praising. We need to start changing our mindset from always wanting to receive more, which is what a prayer feels like most of the time. Sometimes we put our hands together and we look to the skies and we're saying, Oh Lord, Oh God, my life is like this. If only you could add this to my life. So you're making your life always you're always calling from a feeling of lack that my life needs to have more. There's something missing in my life. And that's what the, the, the desperation of prayer feels like. But the Guru is saying, how about we move away from always asking to now praising. Make an attitude of gratitude. Make a mindset that I'm going to sing about the things that I do have and not always worry about what I don't have. And it's so easy for us to fall into the trap of worrying about what we don't have in our life. So let's start bringing gratitude into our life. Let's start bringing joy. Let's start bringing peace and grace into our life. And the Guru is training us. That says every day you need to do more of this. You need to spend more time being in peace, coming from a place of joy, coming from a space of tranquility come from a space that your life already has quite a lot. And it's so easy to think that you don't have so much in your life, but really if you spend some time thinking about what do I have in my life? What is going well in my life? Then you start to focus on those things instead. So the Guru is training us that we need to interact with life in a different way. So take every opportunity to celebrate life. Take every opportunity to sing about the great things that are happening in that day of yours rather than all the things that are not happening and worrying about those things. The other thing that, that the Guru is doing here is that he's not bringing this joy as something that's been brought to his life. He's not thinking, thinking about this joy as something that's come in. He says that I am in bliss like the joy has come out of me and and it's so so easy and and far too often for us to think about god and oneness as something that's far away but really do we even celebrate what we have just inside of us even if there's nothing outside of us that we can think about what about what's inside of us what about the joy of health what about the joy of having the opportunity to be alive Right here, right now, how many times have you just been thankful to just be alive? To be awake to see the sunrise or to be awake to enjoy the sound of the rain? You know, we don't really think about life in these ways. So we're always resisting, we're always fighting with life, we're always complaining. And Guru is saying, 
I'm in a different state of mind. I'm not in this constant agitation. I'm coming from a place of joy and bliss and your life can also be like that if you make your life more like a song. So what we're being taught here in this first verse is start enjoying what is present in life and not always worrying about what is absent. Celebrate what you have, celebrate the aliveness that's within you and all around you and start enjoying life as though it's a song like the birds are singing and the trees are swaying and the sun is shining or the rain is falling. All these things are almost like the whole universe is singing all the time. Look at in Japji Sahib, for those of you who are familiar, it says, Gave Pavan Pani Vesantar. The air is singing, water is singing, fire is singing, the whole universe is singing. What if you were to start seeing life as though it's this great symphony, this orchestra that's happening all around you, and then you realize, hey, I'm also part of the band. I'm also part of the orchestra. I'm also an instrument that, that has the ability to sing out loud. And so when you start to change your life away from what's missing into what is there and celebrating what's there in life, you'll start to experience what the Guru says, Manava Jiyavadhanya, my mind is celebrating. And it says at the end, the Guru ends with these lines, Manajini Vasaya Kehe Nanak Anandhoa. Those who start to think in this way, those who make this their mindset, Nanak says, their minds have become fruitful, they've become joyful, they've become blissful. Anand has happened to them, bliss has occurred in their life. Nanak says, when Satguru Mepaya, when you find that Guru within your life. So I hope that this first verse is something that you have found useful. I hope that this helps you in your life and encourages you to start making those changes and reflecting on how you're living your life and gives you the practical steps that you need to try and move into a space of greater joy and greater bliss in your life. I'm really looking forward to joining you on this journey. So I hope you'll join me in the next episode. And until then, I've written a couple of questions that I want you to think about. So as we're coming to the end of this, have a go at these questions and either answer them by yourself, write them down or talk about them with your friends or in a meetup group where you can discuss these ideas further. Discuss your understanding of the Guru's various forms. The physical form, the formless universal essence and the mind transforming message. How can we have a personal relationship with each of these forms? And what daily practices can you adopt to increase gratitude and to reduce your mental resistance and expectations of life?